Hello, this is David Mandel again, and I wanted to talk a little bit about text editors and things of that type, and GNU Emacs in particular. If when you did assignment three of my class um, on CIS 121 or assignment four or five or six, um, you will need a text editor. I believe the assignment as written says to use Notepad++ plus plus or, uh, or if you're a Mac user to use Sublime. Um, doesn't say what to do if you're a Linux user, so, you know. Um, use Windows. <laughs> in, in a way, as a Linux user, I'm not about to do that. But, um, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about text editors. They really didn't, they don't care what text editor they you, you, you use. The, the assignment just mentioned those two, but you can use any text editor. So what is a text editor? Uh, can you use a word processor? Well, such as Microsoft Office. Well, that would be a poor idea in that. Maybe you could use it, but it would be difficult to use because a text editor is a program that is meant for putting in strict code, just letters without fonts, without paragraphs, without any markings or any markup other than what you might type in as part of the document you're trying to make. But, but a text editor, as the text editor itself is not meant to put in markups, uh, certainly not automatically as in the case of a word processor. A word processor is for writing words. Uh, well, it's for writing documents, letters, um, things of that type that have, as well as the words, they have things like um, um, the fonts have different sizes. We have the choice of 145 different fonts. Uh, you can have it be 12 point, 16 point, 32 point. Um, you can have it be whatever color you want. So as an example, the text off to your side here is in, uh, I believe it's sans 16 uh, using a purple font or a purple color. Um, in a text editor, you have none of that. In text editors are meant for entering um, for writing things like programs, HTML, um, little notes to yourself, like um, uh, just where you don't care about any of this extraneous stuff that makes things look pretty. Okay, I guess you might say a text editor is simpler than a um, um, word processor, except some text editors are, are really very complex. So I don't want to make a general statement that text editors are simpler than uh, word processors. But still, you can kind of think of them that way. Um, Notepad or Notepad++ or something like that comes as part of Windows. It's on every Windows computer. Um, Mac, uh, I don't know, but I'll get back to that later. It said to go out and get Sublime. I guess Sublime is freeware or something. You can get it free without any charge, and then they try to sucker you into paying money or something. I, I don't know. I don't care. Um, what I use, I, I, I in the programming world, it, in my lines of thinking, there are really two text editors. Well, actually, there's hundreds of text editors, but they're kind of babies. Um, there are text editors like Notepad, Sublime, Joe, Pico, Edlin, Sed, 
Oh, I've used hundreds of them, really. I, I mean, just on a simple Linux system, there may be 50 of them. I don't know. There, text editors are a dime a dozen. But professional programmers, uh, at least my colleagues, my friends, tend to settle on two editors. One is called VI, or the improved version of VI is called VIM, VIM, but we all just say VI. Uh, actually, most of us use VIM, but we still say VI. VI is an old editor created in the earliest days of Unix back in the 1970s at Berkeley and it's been around ever since. It's a super powerful editor. It's a little bit quirky and hard to understand unless you remember that the history of the time was that's before we had soft screens and bitmap screens and so sometimes people were typing on teletypes that actually used paper. Other times we sort of had soft screens, but they were they were 80 characters and 24 lines, and you had no choice other than that. Um, they were very limited, uh, usually in a dark green, maybe a black on white, or a white on black, or. Uh, 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 well, and then they, we got fancy ones that were orange or something. But, but really, they were, they were monochrome. Um, well, we eventually got color ones, but they were very simple compared with what we have now. <laughs> Exceedingly so. Um, but VI is a super, super powerful editor. I'm not going to say much about VI, except it's a super powerful editor. It is on almost every Unix system you will ever work on. So everybody that does Unix needs to know a little bit of VI. Um, I always say I know enough VI to edit my .emacs file and get Emacs working the way I want. Um, but the truth is, most of us know some VI. VI is, but, but it's also a very powerful program um, e editor or, or um, text editor that many programmers, professional programmers, hardcore professional programmers use on a day-to-day -day basis. And it can be used as, as really a powerful editor. The other, uh, the other thing nice about VI is there's no problem editing a file of a million lines or, or you know, really super big files like you get if you're editing data files. I've I like VI is cool. Um, the other editor that is around that is cool is one called Emacs. And I'm going to show you a little bit about Emacs today. I should mention VI is on most Unix systems. I believe VI is on as part of the Mac operating system because the Mac operating system down underneath, way down deep, it is uh, based on FreeBSD, which is a Unix system. And at least the few Macs I've worked on, I've been able to find VI. Uh, so it's there. It's cool. Um, it's not on an icon. They don't make it public. you got to go into the shell. I get up a command line shell and type VI, and it's there. Um, the um, um, and VI is available for Windows. Um, just, you know, go to, well, I'm looking here. Uh, type in, you know, go to Google and type in something like VI download um, or VI download for Windows or VI, you know, VI download, and it will give you all sorts of sites where you can download VI from, including vi.org, oh, vim.org. Oh, you'll probably be downloading vim, not vi, but same difference. Um, vim.org, um, which is the uh, 
of this, the site that maintains the VIM software. VI is also open source, or at least VIM is open source. M uh, many versions of VI, including VIM, are open source, and um, that's a real plus. Doesn't cost you any money, and it is um, uh, reliable. <laughs> it will work for you. Um, and it is available for most all operating systems. I think I've even used VI on Android. Um, um, so yeah. Um, the other editor, the one I'm going to talk about today, if we go back over here, is our good friend, uh, which I call GNU Emacs, or usually we just call it Emacs. There's many versions of Emacs, but the one we no normally talk about is, GI, uh, is GNU Emacs. There is another version of Emacs that is kind of a rewrite of Emacs called X Emacs. I don't believe it works on Windows at this point. Um, it's good, but most of and it's a little friendlier than than the GNU Emacs. But um, most of us stick with GNU Emacs, and I, I. I well, if you want to use XEMAX, that's just fine. I don't care what you want to use. And XEMAX is good. Um, I would prefer to stick with G and U Emax, but then I write some Emax code and I depend on some more, at least I used to depend on exotic features. They seem to all work in XEMAX, but I always felt a little safer in, G and e, in just GNU Emacs. GNU Emacs is uh, actually, it was originated by Richard Stallman himself, the kind of the father of the free software movement, or I'd say open source software movement, but he would not say open source because he doesn't accept, accept that term for free software uh, yet. Um, but uh, he was really, the, the, he, he was a key player in writing the GPL, the general public license, and changing the way open source software works. Once again, free software, not open source. Um, the um, And his big technical invention was GNU Emacs, which is God's editor. Um, so let's take a first look at it. GNU Emacs. By the way, I'm working on a Linux machine that has uh, is running something called the KDE desktop and it has probably about eight virtual desktops on it. So when I keep flashing from one to another, that's what's going on. Because I have, you know, lots of open stuff. Um, if you go to Google and type download GNU Emacs or download Emacs, you'll come up with various sites where Emacs is. Emacs is all over the place, but uh, if you go to one of those sites at uh, gnu.org, which is kind of like the home site for GNU Emacs and a lot of other software, you will find um, a page that looks something like this. Want to download Emacs for GNU Linux, for Windows, or for Mac? And you can, it, it, you can get it for all of those. It runs great in all of those. You generally do not have to download it for Linux because it's on all the major Linux distributions and the first 900 minor <laughs> distributions. Uh, GNU Emacs is on most dist Linux distributions unless it's just exceedingly specialized. Um, the um, I guess I made some distributions that doesn't have GNU Emacs, but but they were very, very, very specialized, like firewall only or something like that. Um, and Windows, GNU Emacs, Emacs runs great on Windows. It runs great on Mac. Um, it's, you know. Um, 
I suppose it may have some quirks on Windows. I, I don't know, but for day-to-day -day use, it works fine. Maybe if you got really exotic, because because you don't have all the Unix tools there. Although more and more you're getting most of the Unix tools because even the so-called Bash shell, which comes from Unix, runs on Windows now, uh, on Windows 10, or you can download it for Windows 10 free of charge. Um, so you're getting more and more Unix shells, uh, Unix tools resident on Windows computers. Okay. Um, What's so great about, and so I recommend, you know, maybe if you want to do your assignments and you need a text editor, um, GNU Emacs is the one I'm recommending. Uh, others will work. Use whatever you want. I'm not really pushing it. But uh, I do want you to know what GNU Emacs is. It is really, really a powerful editor. It's a huge editor. Yeah, I said that there were some editors maybe as complex as word processors. Well, it, GNU Emacs is at the upper end of complexity. It, um, I don't want to scare you about it because you can get started with GNU Emacs pretty easy. It's not bad. But you can also do anything you ever, ever want to do within GNU Emacs. People tease about it being an operating system. It's got, it's got, um, it's got its own programming language. So if Emacs doesn't have something, and you program in Lisp, you can add it to. Um, you just add it to the, <laughs> the editor. So it's it's a great editor because you can add anything you want. So people that write a new computer language, the first thing they do once they write a new computer language, first they write a compiler or a way of running the language. Second, they go in and they add a module to Emacs that makes Emacs called a major mode that makes Emacs know about their new language. So you've got some so you've got a really good specialized editor that works on that language. Okay, let's look a little bit at Emacs. I've got an Emacs screen up here. Oh, and if you want to uh, get Emacs You just press on one of these buttons, you download it. I think if you do Windows, it gives you, uh, you know, one of these self-installable zip files or something. Um, you execute that file by double-clicking or something like you would with any Windows software. It goes off, it installs itself, it runs normally. Uh, in the case of Linux, most distributions have their own version of have their own Emacs as part of the distribution. So you go through whatever routine thing your distribution use, uses to add software. You can download it here, but I'd just go to my distribution and download it. Uh, if it's, you know, like if you're using uh, Debian or Ubuntu or one of those distributions, you'd use apt-get. If you use um, um, oh, a Fedora or Red Hat, you'd use um, um, I'm sorry, I'm spaced out. I can't remember. But it's basically you'd use the tool that gets in installs an RPM or else you download it and use the RPM command yourself to install the software. If you're using uh, SUS, well, that's RPM. Open SUS, that's RPM based. But they have a tool called Zipper that you would probably use. Totally misspelled from the way we normally spell Zipper, but that's, yeah. OK. And then you fire up Emacs, you get something like this. And this is. Uh, and it's just an editor. You can use your arrow keys to move around. You can move, use your mouse to highlight things. Uh, there I highlighted Joe. If I go down here, then I can uh, 
copy Joe into there using the copy command, which in Unix is the middle mouse button. In um, I guess it's Control C on a uh, or Control V on a Windows machine. Um, and so on and so forth. And there's lots of menus that, well, there's not lots of menus, but there's enough menus that it will help you out in editing files. Real Emacs people know lots and lots of control sequences. Um, and they've memorized them over the years. There used to be a time when there weren't all these menus and you had to know the control sequences. But if I use a control sequence, you know, if I want to go to the end of the line, I do control E. The beginning of the line is control A. If I want to go over here and highlight Joe, I think I type something like control space, a few characters, control uh, escape W, lowercase w, go to my new spot, and I do a control Y, I think is a yank, and it gives me Joe. OK, I don't want to get carried away with control sequences because I want to convince people. I want somebody to actually use this editor. And you don't need to know too many control sequences. Uh, that was the old days. You can do most of the day-to-day -day things through your menus now uh, and through buttons that have clear labels like insert, delete, backspace, uh, arrow. Um, so you don't really need that many control sequences. The basic control sequences I do recommend learning at some point because not only do they work in Emacs, but they work in the Bash shell, they work in the Corn shell, they work in many, many programs that uh, are written on Unix systems so that you can do a lot of Unix these things actually at the command line um, in many in a good deal of Unix software. And now that Windows has the Bash shell, that's becoming more and more true of Windows as well. Um, and of course, um, Mac always has had the Bash shell, or at least has for many years. So it's true of Macs as well. Um, Macs are basically a Unix machine. Um, one drawback to Emacs is as they're working on it, but as of yet, uh, at least as of the last time I checked, the version of Emacs that sort of kind of was available for Android doesn't work <laughs> at all. It, it, it's not it's not ready to go. So Emacs runs on um, on Macs, on Windows, on any Unix except Android, and um, frustrating, but yeah. Uh, Emacs is awfully, awfully big and complex, and um, the, the Android devices are big enough and can handle that fine, but the Android Apple operating system is pretty primitive as Unix goes, and uh, so it's, it's taking them some time to get it up and working on Android. Um, okay, one of the features of Emacs is it's got something they call buffers. What a buffer is, is we would call them files, but they call them buffers. They're sort of a file, except they're in memory. Um, so they're not saved to your hard disk until you save the file. Um, this star over here means on a read contents dash two dot text means that the file has not been saved. If I go to that guy, uh, there it is there and I can save it and you'll see two stars down here which says the file has not been saved. If I do a save button, uh, it, it says it wrote it to the disk and I need to do that before I get out of Emacs. The way I use Emacs is I may stay in Emacs. You know, I may be logged on to my computer for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months. And I will probably be in Emacs from the time I logged in till the time I log off two months later. 
And I may have hundreds of files open or buffers open, uh, lots of them. Um, this is, uh, well, I started this version this a uh, couple hours ago, and I've got four or five files here. Um, it, it's nothing, you know, I, I can name, I can recall one time I had three or four hundred files open in Emacs at once, and there's probably been many other times too. So, uh, one of the other tools that Emacs has is, let's see if I can find a good buffer here. There's, as I say, if you, there's a couple tools that Emacs have that take some time to learn, and I don't want to teach them to you. Uh, someday I may do a whole series of videos on Emacs, but um, in the, well, actually, if you need to learn something about Emacs on the, um, on YouTube, there's a video on everything on YouTube, right? So, oh, here, there's, you know, hundreds of videos on Emacs on YouTube. Emacs in 10 minutes. Well, I'm doing it. I'm taking longer than 10 minutes. Should have watched their video instead of me. Um, the GNU Emacs, e Emacs tutorial, Emacs tutorial, um, Emacs tutorial. Yeah. Well, there's thousands of videos on GNU Emacs. Um, they're, they're all over the place. There's also thousands of tutorials on VI. So you, you can go to the Go to YouTube and learn something about those. Um, but one of the things that Emacs can do is it has a keyboard macro facility. It's one, one of the first times I ever saw a keyboard macro facility. I think all programs have them nowadays because we learned from Richard Zalman. <laughs> um, but it's a cool idea. Um, and it has the ability that you can add text or you can add your own programs to a program. And sometimes those are complex. And writing Lisp is not for the faint at heart. It's, uh, it's a lot easier to write Python or PHP or anything but Lisp. Lisp is, um, well, actually, it's not that bad. But, but it is a difficult language that takes a new way of thinking. Um, here's a program that I wrote and I saved a while back because I have a process that I do here where I like to add the time and date. And then I have a little form that I fill out. And so it would be cool if Let's see, then tomorrow or the next day here is what? Friday, May. I get tired of just typing those in one by one. So I wrote a little program that I added to my version of Emacs that says type escape X. Um, next day. Ah! Hey, it knows the next day is Friday. That's pretty cool. Um, escape X, next day. OK, so if I want to do this for a month, all I have to do is type in escape X next day 30 times. That's easy. I, why should I have to do that 30 times? Well, Emacs has a little guy in it that says, if I type escape 30, then type escape X next day or type any key, it will do that 30 times because I typed escape X before I typed the 30. So let's type escape X 30. Did I do that right? It's a problem when you think with your fingers and you talk with um, not knowing what you're typing. I, I, I think I did that wrong. OK, let's type escape 30. Forget all of this escape X business. Escape 30. And then it will repeat the next command 30 times. OK, the next command is 
escape x next maybe spelled better than that day and guess what okay I've got a little flaw in my program uh, it's putting a lot of spaces it sh uh, blank lines it shouldn't have but you see what I've got here that is pretty cool look at that it even went from um, May to June that's not my program that's various functions in Emacs that I can call that will basically give me the time and date so I can increment a day by one day and I can get the new date or the new new date and time out of it I'm just doing everything at midnight but well I don't have these big black things in here and I like big black for some reason so I'm going to show you something called a keyboard macro don't pay any attention to the details just the concept that this is cool okay what I'm going to do is I'm going to type um, um, per, um, control X left parenthesis that starts a keyboard macro and I happen to be placed on um, the beginning of the line where I want to make my changes. I was really actually pretty careful placing my cursor in the right place before I started this macro. Then I'm going to do something to take me to the end of the line. Um, I think that's a control E because I know the control sequences. And then I'm going to type in a few spaces. I don't know how many, so I'll just space over. There's where my big goes. So I'll type in B, I, G, black, equal. Then I'm going to go back to the beginning of the line. I think the control uh, sequence for that is a control A. And I'm going to go down one line. I'll just use the arrow key for that. Although I could use a control, I think it's control N or control P. I, I never use that, so I've always got to play with those. OK, and then that's kind of cool. I got one line in here. So I will type, I will close my keyboard macro by typing um, control X followed by the closed parenthesis. And down at the bottom of my screen, it says keyboard macro defined. So there must be a command to execute a keyboard macro. There is. I bet there's one up here in the menus. I don't know. Well, I think there's one in the menus, but I don't know. I, I just type control X E. Hey, that's pretty cool. OK, suppose I want to execute that 20 times. I type escape 20. Control X E. Let's execute it oh, 10 more times. Escape eight more times, eight more times. Escape eight, control E. Well, I could execute a few more times here, but escape four, control E. Okay. Now, actually, there's ways I could even save this keyboard macro, give it a name, and use it tomorrow or in the next day, or but I never. I rarely, I, I don't do that. They, these are just throw away. You put, you make one, you use it, and you throw it away. Uh, and you can do amazing things with keyboard macros and the Emacs programming. Now, it really is a complex field. Really sophisticated Emacs users have probably studied Emacs for a while and and have a lot of time and energy invested. But for purposes of the class, Emacs makes a great little editor. Well, <laughs> it's not little. <laughs> Emacs makes a great editor for doing um, 
HTML, CS, uh, uh, cascading style sheets, Python, uh, writing SQL. Oh, I should show you one of the other cool things about Emacs. Now, this file is not saved, right? Because it's got the two dots down here. So I will save this file. Uh, once again, I could have done that from the menus, but I didn't. Um, I, I will save that file. And remember, I've got other buffers open here. Now, before we leave this buffer, notice this one says text fill down in the bottom line there. There's a little area that says parentheses text fill. That is called the major mode. And it's it doesn't know what type of file this is, so it's calling it a text file. And it's trying to do things like, like text files. Um, but if I go to another buffer here, uh, this you'll notice down here is CSS. And it knows that I'm working with a cascading style sheet, and it will try to give me some help on how cascading style sheets are supposed to be formatted. The, the mode of this, because the file name ends in a CSS, the name of this is, or the, the major mode is cascading style sheets, and it will try to assist me at that. If I go over here to uh, uh, index.html, you'll see that I am in an HTML mode down here at the bottom. It says HTML fill. Okay, and you actually see a menu here that gives me some help. So if I want, say, a line break, I put that in, and guess what? I've got a line break. If I've got a um, ordered pair, well, it gives me an ordered pair here. Or uh, yeah, was that order? Yeah, that's an ordered pair. Um, this, OK, one. Oh, I probably have to put in my own uh, tag here. Yeah, I don't see an ending tag, so slash li. Okay, and I've got to do my own thing there. It, it doesn't, it's not, you know, it's limited the amount of help it gives you. But there are major modes for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different languages and different types of files. There's major modes for C programmers. There's ones for Python programmers. There's ones for Perl programmers. There's ones for doing HTML, for doing SQL, for doing you name it. Some of these major modes give you quite a bit of help. Others give you very little help, but they do exist. Um, and um, some of them give you validation services. Most of them do not. Um, in any case, there is you know, varying degrees of help. Um, my, the whole point I had in this video, which has gone on for a long time, is you know, if you're looking around for an editor, Think about Emacs. Think about VI, because those are editors that will do you for the rest of your life. Um, or, well, I, I don't know. But they'll do you for a long, long time. They're good editors to know. Those are what I consider the, you know, those are the two that I consider to be the gold standard of editors. Anything that looks like a VI or anything that looks like a Emacs, those are good editors. And so you get a chance to delve into one of those a little bit. You should do it. Um, they're both a little bit hard, but not ter but 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 not terribly hard to begin with, and to do, you know, to use it for your day-to-day -day work. And 
then they get harder because you want to start learning how to program in 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 um, Emacs Lisp and 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 but by that time you know that it's worth it or you don't carry it that far and actually most people don't carry it that far because I don't know many people that program very well in in uh, Emacs Lisp I used to but uh, but uh, but I think that's fairly rare skill and but still professional programmers even though few of them program in Emacs Lisp or add much Emacs to their editor um, tens of thousands of them <laughs> use it every day for their professional work so um, so it's cool okay I have gone on considerably considerably longer than I meant to go on so I'd better end here bye bye